Thank you for joining us here online at Hope Church, Boulder City, Nevada. We are honored that you are here, and we believe that God is going to use this service to bless you and many others around the world. Here at Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live a life of a Jesus follower. We believe that a Jesus follower abides in Christ, connects in community, and shares in the mission. There are so many amazing things happening in our church that we'd like for you to be a part of. If you'd like to find out more, please visit us at hopechurchbc.com or you can find us on Facebook at HC Boulder City. On behalf of Hope, we thank you once again for worshiping with us and we pray that you enjoy the service. Well, good morning, Hope Church Boulder City. <laughs> if you are a guest with us today, you honor us with your presence. And I want to make sure that you get yourself one of these gift bags. One of these here gift bags. We got them on the table out there in the foyer. Uh, in these gift bags are gifts, yes. Uh, one being a, a nice coffee mug and the other one being a really nice, uh, a really good video defending the uh, biblical principle of God creating the heavens and the earth in the beginning from a scientific perspective, a bit of a science buff, and, and I think you, uh, you'll enjoy it whether you are or not. But the second thing that you'll find in there, or you'll find one of these in the seat pocket in front of you, is a connection card. If you would, if you want to fill one of these out with some basic information, here's why we ask you to do this. Because virtually every week we produce a video and it's all about what's going on here at Hope Church Boulder City. And if we can have your phone number to send you a text with your mobile phone, uh, we will send you a link. And if we have your email, we will send the, that link in, in the form of an email. So either way or both for many of you, let me encourage you to do that so you can know what's going on. Well, what's going on today is a lot. Well, we, here's what today is going to look like. First of all, we are going to worship God in spirit and in truth with this team. Amen? I know you're not supposed to turn you're not supposed to turn your back on an audience, but they deserve it. Um, and, and then we are going to open up the Word of God and ask the Holy Spirit of God to speak to us through His Word and to show us things that would otherwise be beyond us because that way we can be changed and conformed more into the image of Christ and that will be a good thing, amen? amen? When we dismiss, we are all going outside to baptize. We have a, a bunch of people that are going to be baptized today. When we do that dismissal, those of you who are going to be baptized, I need you to come up here for just a couple minutes. Then after everybody else gets out there, I and those of you who are going to be baptized will go out as well. And I will ask you, do not try to go into the kitchen to get your food before the baptism is over. Uh, because I've instructed them to not serve you. That should fix that. <laughs> so let me encourage you if, you, if you don't want to go outside, that you just hang out in here for a little bit and wait for us to all kind of parade back in. And as you can tell, the lead up is that we're having a big Thanksgiving dinner. We, we, uh, we ordered a ton and a half of turkey, and a lot of people are bringing sides and everything, and so we're going to be eating in there, outside, just all over the place. So let me encourage you, if you didn't know all that was going to happen today, to stay for it because it's a big day. But as we prayed earlier, it's not that we want to plan and have a big day. It's our desire that God has planned and will have a big day here. Amen. Well, God bless you for being here. And Michael, it is all yours, my friend. Amen. Well, good morning, Hope Church, Boulder City. God is good. We're so thankful to be here on another Sunday. Why don't you stand to your feet as we worship our Lord and Savior? When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, Stand a chance when I stand in your love, my 
fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not captive to it. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Come on, my fear. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. You may be seated in Jesus' name. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you, you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. To your glorious light. You took 
took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of His blood applied. Glory to His name. Let's pray. Lord, indeed, glory to Your name. You so deserve our praise. You so deserve our worship because you have been so very, very good to us. Nothing we ever do can repay you for what you have done for us. But God, I pray that you would move us to live lives of faithfulness in gratitude. Lord, we ask you today that you would clear our hearts and our minds of all the, the jumble that we have, may have brought into the building with us. And God, we come before you to confess our sins that we might worship you in spirit and in truth with clean hands and pure hearts. God, we know, we confess because week after week after week, we blow it. And week, time after time after time, you forgive us. Oh, Holy Spirit, move in our midst. Teach us your word. And glorify our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen. church. Stand up. Let's praise the Lord. Amen. I 
Hallelujah. We raise a hallelujah. 
we just, we thank you. God, in the season of thankfulness, Lord, we thank you first because you first love us. God, I just pray for you to move in this place this morning, God. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you. God, now we just ask that you just move through Pastor Don, God. Give us your words, your message, your heart for us, Lord, and may us be changed. May we be changed this morning, God. Let us not walk out of here the same people that we walked in. We love you, Lord, and we ask this in your name. Amen. You know, obviously, we thank God for all he's done and the privilege to come before him and and to worship. It's all about him. But we also, I think it would, we, it behooves us to give our worship team a proper, a proper sense of gratitude. Thank you so much, team. If you're a regular here, you recognize how different the setup is with the tables over here and the tables back there and, the, and everything out front because, as I said earlier, we're going to be baptizing several people and we're also going to be having a big meal. And I want to thank Paul while he's in the room right now. You, you may not know this, but he spent like a day and a half up here setting everything up and then came back in yesterday, and Stephanie came with him to help him. And um, it, it is a real blessing to me, for me to not have to be down here setting up tables and chairs and stuff like that. And so I can spend my focus, what little I have, <laughs> in those things that I have been called to do. Well, as you can see, our, our verse today is from Acts chapter 2, verse 41. For thousands of years, mankind has been using symbols, and they're still a big part of life today. So today we're going to play a game, and it's going to be called Name That Symbol. <laughs> First of all, the Nike swoosh, of course. It's, it's a symbol of a company. That's not the company. That's a symbol of the company. When we see that, we think shoes, athletic wear, and a whole lot of other stuff. Batman, this is a symbol of a fictitious superhero. Oh, is Michael Keaton in here? I'm sorry, Michael. I, 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 I didn't mean fictitious. <laughs> we have a, for those of you that don't know, we have a Michael Keaton in here who was the star that, one of the stars that played the role of Batman. And, of course, that's his logo on his truck and every, everywhere else. Um, but don't, it, it, are you in here, Michael? Okay. Okay, I, I, don't tell him the fictitious part, okay? <laughs> okay, now, now these last two, it gets a little bit harder. But specifically, the wedding rings. Like I said, the, the wedding rings are a symbol of a marriage relationship. And, this, and again, they're, they're getting progressively harder. This is the hardest one. Petroglyphs, thank you. Petroglyphs, these are symbols, and they are symbolic of a people group's history. This is not the people group. This is a symbol that tells a story about them. That is not a marriage relationship. Those are rings that point us to the marriage relationship. And today we're going to talk about a symbol in the New Testament that virtually everybody here knows something about, but that is very often misunderstood. That symbol is baptism. And today we're going to answer the question, what is baptism? And we're going to do that by examining four defining truths about baptism that we find in the New Testament. That first defining truth and statement is... Baptism is the first step of obedience as a follower of Jesus. Okay, well, so, so let, let me back up a little bit. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Let, let me begin to answer that with a, 
a little background to today's verse. When we get to our verse in Acts 2, we, there, there, the things leading up to that in the first couple chapters, it, it is during the season of the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost was one of the big events on the Jewish calendar. It, occurred, it occurs 50 days after Passover. And, and, and what's going on here is that the, the Jewish feast, one of the big three Jewish feasts that are on the calendar, the, the, those, the three big Jewish feasts on the Jewish calendar require everybody, every single Jew, to make a good faith effort to be in Jerusalem for it. So that means the city is just absolutely crammed, pack with, crammed, packed with pe- crammed and packed with people. John MacArthur said this of it. He said, it was one of the three annual feasts for which the nation was to come to Jerusalem. Now get that, a nation coming to a city. So you can, you can imagine how crowded it was and all the hustle and bustle and everything that was going on. And the apostle Peter had just preached a sermon to thousands of those gathering telling them it wasn't a, it wasn't a feel good warm fuzzy sermon he had he told them that they had just just a few weeks seven weeks before were the people out there crying crucify him crucify him and he took them through the old testament and showed them all the, the some prophecies of the old in the old testament about the messiah and explained how he had fulfilled every one of them and then he told them you have killed the Messiah by giving him over into the hands of godless men to do so. And the Holy Spirit of God was moving across the place because their response was four words. What shall we do? It's like, what have we done? What were we thinking? It was so, it's so clear now. Why didn't we see it then? And Peter's response was twofold as far as their actions were concerned. He said, one, repent. Now, what does it mean to repent? You know, that's a word we throw around a lot. It, it means to turn from one thing and turn unto another. And, and in the context here, obviously, in the biblical context, it is to turn from sin, the self-guided life that pursues those things that we just simply want because we want them, and turn from that life, turn from that pursuit of sin, and turn unto the holy, righteous God we just sang about. Holy, holy, holy. And the second part, as far as their actions were concerned, was to be baptized. He said, repent. Repent. And then be baptized. You see it right there in our verses. So then those who had received his word had received, what word? Had received the apostle Peter's words in the sermon that he had just preached. Telling them that that the one that they had crucified was the long-awaited Messiah. That all the world of of Judaism was was waiting for. When he got here, he didn't meet their standards. He wasn't some conquering king on a white stallion coming riding in and and, and pushing back the Roman oppression. He came humble as a baby in a manger and as a, a homeless guy who walked around teaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he says, and so then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. Wow. That day, they were baptized. Why, why so quickly? What, didn't they need to think about what they were doing? Shouldn't they have spent their time praying about it? Well, I'm a little spoiler alert here. If the Bible tells you to do something, you have no business praying about it. <laughs> Let me put it this way. You have no business praying about whether or not to obey it. 
didn't they need to first go through some discipleship class or something? And apparently not. That might be how we do it in the 21st century, but, but seven weeks and a day after Jesus' ascension, or seven weeks minus a few days, sorry, this is how they did it. And remember Jesus' last words, and we call it the Great Commission, there at the very end of the book of Matthew, Jesus said it like this. He said, go therefore and make disciples. A disciple is a follower. Now, how, how do you make a disciple? How do you make a follower? Well, you tell someone the story of Jesus, that a Messiah came to save them from their sins so that they could be so that he could take their sin from them so that God would be justified in declaring us righteous as laid out in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, then baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So a, a lot, to, to reinforce the model that we saw in Acts 2 uh, of being baptized that same day, Jesus is telling us we, 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 tell, we share the gospel with people, and if they, if they choose to become a disciple, if they choose to become a follower of Jesus, then you baptize them, and then you teach them how to live the life of a Jesus follower. Pretty simple model. And so here's Peter telling them the story of Jesus and how they had crucified him, but, and he encouraged them to repent and to become a follower. And, but why tell them to be baptized? Well, it's kind of like the reason I wear a wedding band. It's a symbol. It, it tells people a story. And in fact, in the New Testament... And in many places still today, baptism is not optional for a believer. And here's what I mean. There are, there are some circumstances under which people become followers of Jesus and they are in environments or in cultures that do not look favorably upon this decision. And so the, the, if baptism wasn't optional because people weren't even really convinced that you had become a Christian if you didn't announce it publicly with the symbol of baptism. Because once you do that, baptism is designed to take place in a very public place for all to see. You are, in effect, saying, I have, turned, I have repented of my sin. I have repented of the life I once lived, and I now am a follower of Jesus. I now fully desire for him to tell me how to live my life and I will obey. Perfectly? No. But man, it's like a compass. The, the needle always swings back towards obedience unto him. They didn't know if you were really serious about your commitment to Christ. If you weren't willing to go out in public and say, this is who I am anymore, I am not who I used to be. In Muslim countries, that can mean anywhere, anything from being disowned by your family and your entire extended family being forbidden forever, from ever speaking your name again to physical, per political, and even violent persecution. And such was the case in Jerusalem because the place was filled with the, the Jews from all over. And so those who had not received Christ would be looking at them and going, Oh, you traitor, you. And the fact that baptism was not even really optional for, for people who had become Jesus followers... Um, that led to people erroneously saying that if you haven't been baptized, you haven't truly been born again, as Jesus put it. You haven't truly been saved. Because it was so integral, the, the outward public announcement was so integral to the inner decision. And today, some denominations even teach as core doctrine 
that baptism is essential to salvation. But just to be clear, this is not true. Baptism is a part of the Christian experience, but it's not a part of the salvation experience. Well, secondly, baptism is a public confession of devotion to Jesus, as we've just said. Back to our verse, Acts 2, 41. So then, those who had received his word were baptized. Well, again, what word? Peter's preaching about Jesus and who the Bible says he is, that he is the Messiah who had come to save his people from their sins. But notice what it said. It says, those who had received. That's, that's, those are both past tense. So the baptism happens after having heard and then received. What does the word receive mean? The, word, the Greek word there means to fully embrace something. Uh, leave, leave nothing on the field. Just fully embrace the message of Jesus being the salvation of the world. So they had, past tense, fully embraced his word, the preaching of Jesus. So these people weren't being baptized to begin a relationship with Jesus. They had already fully embraced. They had received his word, and they were baptized. They were being baptized to publicly declare they had done so. And, and again, let's, let's go back to the illustration of the wedding ring. It, it's, a, it's a symbol of a relationship that exists between a husband and a wife. The, the ring is not the relationship, but the ring does point out a relationship that I have with my wife, and she hates it when I do things like this. <laughs> this, this ring tells you something about me, and her ring tells you something about her. It's not the relationship. If I take the ring off, it doesn't mean I'm not married. Although if I did take it off, I, she may soon make that happen. <laughs> and, and if I wasn't married and I put one on, that wouldn't make me married. It, 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 baptism, the, the presence or the absence of baptism doesn't make or not make a person born again. But it does say something says, I've committed myself to a relationship with my wife, and I want the world to know. Since 1978, I've been walking around telling the world that I'm married. And then in 1984, I was born again into a relationship with Jesus. And one day later, Nell was too. This ring serves as a public declaration of my relationship with Nell, and in a similar fashion, God has given us a way to publicly declare our relationship with him. It's called baptism. Well, thirdly, baptism is a personal embracing of a local church family. This is often overlooked. Back to our verse. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Added to what? They had already fully embraced the truth that Jesus was the Messiah. They had already turned from their self-guided life unto a Jesus-guided life. So spiritually, spiritually speaking, they were already a part of the church big c capital c church the the universal church if you will that happened at the point of their salvation at the point of their decision to, to become a follower of jesus the baptism happened after that and they were added to something after that to what they were being added to the local church the small c church there in jerusalem the church at Jerusalem, according to the previous chapter, had about 120 people in it. I'd call this a good Sunday. <laughs> Where 3,000 people became followers of Jesus and were baptized and became a part of that local church. In this act of being added there were actually statements being made by two different groups of people here. One, by the church. 
they were publicly embracing those who were being baptized and saying, they are now part of us. And on the part of these new believers, they were saying, I am now a part of them. And, and, and God brings together people like that and he, and, he's put, and he plants spiritual gifts and talents in them and he brings them together for the building up of the entire body as they, as they come together. So don't underestimate your role in this church. Where would we be right now if not for these people up here volunteering? You can obviously see the contribution they make to the edification, the building up of this body. You can obviously look around at the furniture and see the, the contribution that Paul made this week as a volunteer, bringing his spiritual gifts and his desires and his talents and his, and his sheer strength to, to bring about this setup. Everything that this church is designed to do by God has been entrusted to the gifts and the, and the talents and the, that, that he has put in you. I said earlier, I especially appreciate him coming and setting up. Keeps me from doing it. Keeps me where I'm supposed to be. Focused here. But how many pastors are so overloaded and overwhelmed with things because pastors of a church are, the church is here hanging in midair and the pastor is the safety net. Everything that doesn't get, that get done falls to him. That comes from a pastor's wife, that amen. And it cripples the church's ability to fulfill the mission God has put on it. Well, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. Fourthly, baptism is a picture of the new life. Here's the illustration. Here's, as it's been called before, the, the wordless, wordless sermon. Here, here's what is being publicly declared by the act, the physical act of baptism. First of all, You and I have sinned. If you're expecting world class artistry, you're about to be gravely disappointed. <laughs> Let's say this is God. He made everything. He made the stars. He made the heavens. He created heaven and earth. And he made me. And he made my sweet wife. And he made you. It was a good setup. It was a good arrangement. But then we messed it up. We sinned. The book of Isaiah says it like this. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. God being holy and now us being not. We caused a separation between us and God. So by sinning, we created this separation from God. But God did not 
want it to stay that way. So that, he could, so that we could be reconciled back unto God. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, that, that's us, that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life instead. And Jesus took the magnanimous step of taking your sins and nails sins and my sins on himself. problem is the Bible says that the wages of sin is death as bad as what you're thinking about right now is physical death and the Bible even tells us in the book of Romans that death came into the world by sin the death itself piggybacked on sin but the worst part of it isn't the physical death. The worst part is the spiritual death, the separation from God that sin causes. Jesus didn't just suffer the physical death. He also suffered the separation from God while he bore our sins on himself. A relationship that had stood unmolested and uninterrupted for all eternity. He willingly separated himself from his Father to take our sin. This is actually why Jesus on the cross, when he said this, he wasn't asking the question because he didn't know the answer. He was asking the question so that we would know the answer. He said, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? He knew why God had separated himself from Jesus. Jesus understood that. In fact, the night before, when Peter tried to defend him from the, the, the night before the crucifixion, when Jesus tried to defend him, I mean, when Peter tried to defend Jesus from the crowd that came to arrest him, he took out his sword and smacked off the ear of the high servant's priest and was going to fight him off, or at least try to, all by himself. And he said, Peter, put your sword away. This is why I have come. He knew what he had gotten into before the manger he knew what he was doing and he knew that this separation was going to be a part of when he said my God my God why have you forsaken me that's when those things started happening all around the ground began to shake the, the graves were opened up the Bible says and that people walked into town who is it uh, it's Joe no it's not Joe I just went to his funeral a month ago no it's Joe look it's Joe Joe was a follower of Jesus. And now the answer was uh, multifold. The answer was that, that the God had forsaken him so that we could be raised from the dead one day and, and be with Christ because, because now we're clean enough to do that. Because once Jesus takes your sin, the separation is no longer there. And said the, the, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, it says. That was a four-inch massive like rug, that, like curtain, that was torn from the top to the bottom. And it opened up the one place that nobody was allowed to go except the high priest. And that was only one day of the year. That was the Holy of Holies where God resided, where God met with mankind. And it opened it up saying, it's the, the door's been flung wide open for all of you now. During that time, Jesus suffered the physical death and the spiritual death that would have been ours had he not come. And having done so, see, you, you know, we, we hear a lot about justice these days. Justice is when right is 
in, in full reinforced and, and, and wrong is punished. I mean, that's what we want from our judicial system. We want right to be, we want people who, who, are, who do that which is right to be rewarded for it. We want people who are, who are wrong to be punished for it. God could not, God is a just God. That means that justice is one of the, the, the core foundational characteristics of God. He couldn't have accepted us into his presence had not Jesus taken those things that caused the the separation in the first place. So God is now justified in, in calling us righteous because the sin that we committed is now elsewhere. The punishment for the sin we committed has been paid by another. Jesus bore that sin on the cross and he was buried in a tomb. But thankfully for us, three days later, the stone was rolled away And Jesus was raised from the dead without sin once again to dwell with the Father. During the interim between these two periods, now for 40 days, he walked around on earth. All his friends saw him. People, there were historians that were not Christians that write about seeing Jesus. Jewish historians who had no real reason other than this simple fact that, that to write about them seeing him. And now we get back to baptism. In the same way that Jesus died. And what do you do with someone who has died? You bury them. That's what baptism does. You you bury someone. They've been buried in the water. And then just like Jesus rose from the dead. We are raised from the grave. And we've been raised to walk in a different life. Listen to how the old man that I was before is buried, never to be seen again. The new man that I am now. Uh, you know, I might not be all I, all I ought to be, but hallelujah, I'm not what I used to be. And, and, the, and the new man has been raised to walk in a new life. Here it is in Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now, oddly enough, I want to tell you that there are two groups of people here today who should not get baptized. The first group of people that should not get baptized is people who do not have a relationship with Jesus. Baptism is meaningless without a relationship with Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you don't need to be baptized. You need to be born again. In the same way that my, this wedding ring would, be, would mean nothing without nail. A baptism means nothing without Jesus. So, begs the question, how does one become born again? I want to listen to John's summary of Jesus coming to earth in John chapter 1. He said this, he said, he came to his own. He came to the Jewish people, first and, primarily and first. And those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born, they were born again, they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
born again in a process that, that God has initiated and carried out. Born again to be somebody different this time around. And so the, the, the idea here is that they believed in his name. What does that mean? Does that mean that the, the, the Jewish historians that wrote about Jesus being a real person that they saw, does that mean that they, since they believe in the name of Jesus that, that they, they become followers of Jesus? No. It's just like with the apostle Peter when, when he says that they received his word. He had just explained to them what it was all about. He had just explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah that had been foretold of throughout the Old Testament and it's the same thing here. When we believe in his names, it means we, we believe, we fully embrace, we receive the whole package of who Jesus is, who, who the Bible says he is, not who we think or somebody else thinks he is. And so the, the, the question is, it, it, it's a fully embracing. My question would be, do you believe that we've sinned against God and created a separation between the two of us I think we're, I think we're all honest enough to, to admit that we've sinned against God and, and, and Isaiah 59 2 clearly told us that our sins have separated us from God and do you believe that Jesus took your sin and Nell's sin and my sins and everybody's sin on himself and that he carried those sins to the cross do you believe that, that God raised him from the dead as evidenced in the New Testament uh, on, on Easter morning and the, and the subsequent 40 days where he walked, went and all over the place and was seen by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people? And do you desire to turn from a self-guided life that puts you in the situation where you had your sin and you were separated from God? Do, do you desire to turn from a self-guided life to a to a life that is guided by Jesus as your Lord and, and to say, yes, I, I saw how I've handled it. And so now I want you to handle it. You lead, I'll follow. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If you believe these things and you have never come to this point in your life before where you said, yes, I know and I believe these things and for the first time, I want to make that decision for myself and become a follower of Jesus. Well, let me give you some good news. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You think, well, God wouldn't want me. That, that's, that's, that was my prayer when I came to Christ. I was on my knees in a friend's house. He had led me to, to he had shown me the scriptures for over a period of six months. And, and, and there I was, and I said, oh, God, if you want me, you can have me. And, and I instantly was overwhelmed with the thought, what do you mean if? Do you know what I did to rescue you. How could you ask me if I want you? Before we continue, I, I, I want to give you the opportunity to become a follower of Jesus. Let me implore you to pray with me. And just pray something like this. I don't care if you pray it to yourself. I don't care if you pray it out loud. I don't care if you use different words. But something like this, oh God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin has separated me from you being a holy God. And I know and I believe that Jesus took my sin on himself. And I believe he died a physical death and that he suffered the spiritual separation from you that I would have had to pay had he not intervened and I believe that you O oh God raised him up from the dead proving that his sacrifice for my sin was sufficient and I now submit myself unto you Jesus my Lord 
that you might lead me in a life that you desire. So I ask you to save me. Lead me and I will follow. In Jesus' name I thank you. Amen. If you have just prayed that prayer and you've truly meant it, and this is the first time, let me be the first to welcome you into the family of God. And, and, and let me also tell you that your next step is baptism. You may be wondering, well, how can I do that? I didn't come prepared. Well, we have a whole box of brand new sweats that we bought for anybody who has just given their life and committed themselves to Christ. And you too can be baptized today. You can change it. We've got like half a dozen at least suits of, of sweats here that you can put on and be baptized in. But now let's quickly go to the other group of people that should not be baptized. That is, people who have already been baptized according to the teachings of Jesus. Baptism isn't something that happens over and over again in your life as a believer. If you were baptized according to the teachings of Jesus, it's a one-time public declaration. Uh, and there are three components to being baptized according to the teaching of Jesus as practiced in the New Testament church. And, and I know we, we as, a, as, a, as the human race, we've come up with some other ways to do this, but I'm thinking that if we just look at how they did it seven weeks after <laughs> Jesus, that we'll probably be getting it right. But first of all, as we said, it must be after salvation. After the resurrection of Jesus, the only baptism in the New Testament is a baptism of believers. That's just, there, there are our examples. Secondly, it must be by immersion. Wayne Grudem says it like this. He says, the practice of baptism in the New Testament is carried out in one way. If we want to do it like, you know, you say, well, no, I, I've been part of a church that did it another way. I, I, let me suggest that we do it like they did in the New Testament. It can only be carried out in one way. The person being baptized was immersed or put completely under the water and then brought back up again. And let me tell you right now, it is up to the discretion of the pastor how long between the under and the up. <laughs> if I know some things about you, I'm liable to hold you under and shake you a bit. <laughs> But baptism isn't a Baptist word. It's not a Catholic word. It's not a Presbyterian word. It's not a Methodist word. It's a Greek word. And here's the meaning. To dip, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging. It was actually, it was a Greek word that was used of a number of things. One was, was ships that had sunk. They'd say, that ship is baptized. Sounds weird to us, but that's the meaning of the word. And that was the usage of the word. Or it was also used by, uh, for the process of dyeing garments they'd completely dip them in the dye it's just a simple practical word well and thirdly it must be in fellowship with a community of believers remember that part where where you you are now saying the the congregation is now saying they are a part of us and the and the believers are saying i am a part of them that that's how it's that's how it's done in the bible But if you aren't a part of either one of those groups, today you need to be baptized. Let me say it another way. If you have a relationship with Jesus and you have not been baptized after salvation by immersion in fellowship with the local church, you need to be baptized today. It really is that simple. And don't think, <laughs> see, I've been baptized three times. But wait, Pastor, you said it's not something that you do over and over and over. No, it's something you only do once when you get it right the first time I was baptized I was 13 years old I didn't have a clue what I was doing I walked up I shook the preacher's hand and I got baptized didn't mean a thing to me second time I was a believer in Christ I had, we had become Christians and the friend that led the two of us to Christ as, as good as his intentions were he baptized me with no connection to a local church 
Now, it was a swimming pool. The swimming pool didn't make it ineffective. I mean, you know, the, Philly, the, the youth Ethiopian eunuch, Philip, baptized him in, the, in a ditch. We've, we've got a better arrangement than that. <laughs> but the third time, I had a relationship with Jesus, and I did so in fellowship with the local church. And so I checked all the boxes and got it right. Let me encourage you today, in closing, that if you came here today to be baptized, or if you have just committed yourself unto Christ in a relationship with Him, and didn't know you needed to be baptized today, or if you have already had a relationship with Christ, and you have not been baptized in a biblical fashion, let me encourage all three of those groups to be baptized today. And when, again, I said it earlier, but when we dismiss for everybody to go outside, everyone who's going to be baptized needs you to come up, come up here for just a couple minutes before we meet everyone else out, out, out there. Again, if you, if you brought your clothes and your towel, wonderful, we've got both. We've got a box full of brand new towels and we've got a box full of new clothes. So, ah, it's late, so I've got I to gotta, I gotta keep moving here. Um, God bless you, folks. I, I, I hope this has cleared up some questions that you might have. I hope it has enhanced your understanding of baptism. And I, and I look forward to those of you who may realize, who may have just realized this morning that you need to be baptized in a biblical fashion. So uh, meet me up here in just a couple minutes. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, we have come, uh, uh, these days we're, we're receiving the offering in a way that takes less time during the service. And it doesn't pressure people into giving because that has always bothered me. When, when people have a plate or something passed by them and they feel compelled to give. And so to eliminate the, the time and the pressure, we're doing it a little bit differently here these days. Uh, if you, we have some white receptacles. There's one on the wall there and there's one at the doors as you leave. If you have an offering today, you can feel free to drop it in if you want to give. Secondly, our Hope, our Hope Church BC website up in the top right corner, there's a tab that says Give. It'll take you to something like this. You enter an amount at the top, and it's imperative if you want the if you want your gift to go to this campus that it says Ties Boulder City. You may have to go find a drop down menu and scroll through it and find our name. Anything else, it goes to the main campus in Las Vegas. Thirdly, you can text Hope Church LV to seven seven nine seven seven, and you'll get the Hope app. And down in the bottom right corner is a little place which you can hit that says give, and it takes you to a similar setup. And once again, you'll need to make sure that it says Boulder City in there, or it will go to the main campus. And last but certainly not least, you can mail your giving to the address there on the screen. Well, have a couple other things. I want to, some announcements to keep you posted. Um, first of all, if you're a guest with us today, indeed, you honor us with your presence. Make sure that you... If you want to start getting the update videos that we produce virtually every week, let me encourage you to put some contact information on there. But there are some, also some spots for any decisions you, have made, you may have made. Like uh, I have just, uh, today I began a relationship with Jesus and others. So let me encourage you to do that so we can come alongside you and help, help you walk the life of a Jesus follower. Secondly, make sure you grab one of the gift bags. They are not in the foyer. The table is right here. Uh, on, on the back wall thirdly now some of you are thinking well what's that about you may not know this but uh, the we paid like 20 grand for the first half of our big playground canopy quite some time back they, they manufactured it and with all the stuff that's going on the shortages and all they finally got it all together is my understanding then we had a problem because we realized didn't know before that we were violating city code in putting a, a structure in the front. The fence doesn't require a permit. A structure does. So the other night, Wednesday night, we, uh, Neil and I went to, at, to City Hall and were, uh, went to a meeting with the Planning Commission. Neil, as our uh, contractor, uh, spoke on our behalf and they uh, approved the, the variance that we needed to put up a, can a canopy out here. <laughs> Yay, canopy. <laughs> 
which we're real glad for that because we would have just forfeited the first the twenty thousand bucks. So now we just got to give them another twenty thousand bucks, and they're gonna probably fairly soon be working on that. So hallelujah, it's been a long time coming. Amen. Amen. Last but uh, lastly, if you have any questions or you want to contact me for anything, you can do so at don at hopechurchlv.com. Well, we are about to be dismissed. Again, those of you who are going to be baptized, please join me.